The world has watched in horror events at the Westgate shopping mall where terrorists killed more than 60 civilians, injured dozens more and held many hostage for days. A Somalian group called Al-Shabaab has claimed responsibility, blaming Kenyan involvement in military action in southern Somalia. It's been hard to work out what's been happening and even harder to work out what will happen next. So to help shed some light on a complex situation, we're joined on Enzo now by former US government intelligence consultant. Now he's the director of the geopolitical risk assessment consultancy 36 Parallel, Dr. Paul Buchanan. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on the programme. Uh, the media seems to be saying that, that al-Shabaab is, is part of al-Qaeda. Is it as simple as that? Uh, no, it's not. And they may be giving the, them way too much credit. Uh, the parallel I would draw is that in the 60s and 70s, when indigenous revolutionary movements of a Marxist persuasion emerged in Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, the West tended to brand them as being pro-Soviet or Soviet-inspired or pro-Chinese when in fact a lot of those Marxist movements had nothing to do with the Soviet Union or the People's Republic of China. They were indigenous expressions of armed rebellion against local oppression. And the same is true for al-Shabaab. Al-Shabaab shares a fundamentalist ideology with al-Qaeda, but they're much more territorially fixated on Somalia. And uh, many, many would argue that there are Somalian nationalists who happen to have a very fundamentalist view of Islam. So uh, to wrap themselves in the banner of al-Qaeda uh, is a smart strategy on their part, but I fear that the West gets suckered into thinking that every indigenous expression of fundamentalist Islam is somehow connected to al-Qaeda when in fact, uh, if they're connected at all, it's more ideological than material. So when the foreign minister, the Kenyan foreign minister th this morning was saying, saying it is an al-Qaeda attack, not an al-Shabaab attack, it's there's another agenda going on there. Well, you're right. I mean, the, the thing is, when you yell terrorism, uh, no one's going to say that you should not counter terrorism. And so governments the world over, Western and non-Western, will attempt to paint any such atrocity as the work of the evil masterminds of al-Qaeda because more funding flows to security agencies, it can justify uh, draconian security laws, uh, some of which we've seen here in New Zealand with the justification that they're counterterrorism laws. And so it's not surprising that both al-Shabaab would attempt to claim some affiliation and then the Kenyan government would want to p point the finger of blame at al-Qaeda because if anything else, it's going to attract Western uh, support and assistance for their anti-terrorism uh, efforts. The attack in Nairobi was was... I guess you would say daring and horrifying at the same time. I mean, this is a this is a major upscale shopping mall. It's full of of foreigners, expats, the the upper class of Kenya. The 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 president's uh, nephew and his wife were were among the victims. I mean, this this is as high a profile as as any attack would get. Well, in terms of symbolism, it certainly was uh, a, a very adroit attack. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, there had been many warnings that the Westgate would be the target. Uh, again, a lot of, lot of Westerners, uh, the Kenyan elite. Uh, so there was a socioeconomic class as well as ideological uh, uh, motive in, in this attack. But we have to be very clear. Uh, this attack has, is of no military consequence. An attack on a soft target, unarmed civilians in a poorly defended place uh, does not change the military equation between al-Shabaab and the Kenyan military, both inside of Somalia, where the Kenyan military is part of an African Union peacekeeping force, and certainly not within Kenya. So uh, the symbolism may have been not only an attack on the pro-Westernized Kenyan elite, it could well be a way of trying to drive a wedge deeper between the one-third of Kenyans who are Muslim and the two-thirds who are Christian. And we must remember that in 2007, uh, around the timing of the elections of 2007, there was serious violence between Muslims and non-Muslims. And so they may be trying to play on that. 
So th- let's talk a bit about Somalia itself because that's on it's on Kenya's sort of northern northern border. It's it's a basket case. It hasn't had a proper government since what 1991, 92, something like that. Uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, the the aid organisation, pulled all its staff out uh, last month. So they effectively have there's no health system. It it's as as difficult a situation for a country as you can imagine. So so what's going wrong there? Oh, well, a failure of governments. I mean, you know, Somalia represents uh, one of the classic cases of a failed state. And what's important to notice about failed states is that's where extremists flourish, because they become the de facto sovereigns of the territory that they control. And Somalia is not alone in this. I mean, even Pakistan has areas where the central authorities don't dare to go. So it's not just a Somali problem, but Somalia clearly is a very classic instance. And so what you have is you have a central government that's backed by non-Somalian interests. Uh, but it's corrupt. It's uh, effective control outside the capital, Mogadishu, is contestable at best. And certainly in the southern Somalia, uh, you know, al-Shabaab was the de facto ruler of southern Somalia from about 2007 to 2011 when Kenyan forces unilaterally went into southern Somalia and pushed al-Shabaab out of two important cities, one a port city and one which apparently is the charcoal capital of Africa. The importance of those two is that al-Shabaab was able to tax the revenues of both piracy coming out of that port and the charcoal trade in order to fund their militant activities. Well, all of that was removed when the Kenyans went in in 2011. They killed a lot of al-Shabaab fighters. Al-Shabaab was forced to disperse and head north. And now the Kenyans constitute the core of that African peacekeeping force that is somewhat tenuously keeping the peace. So this represents a regrouping. And we have to remember that in 2010, al-Shabaab conducted an attack in Uganda in which 78 people were killed uh, watching the World Cup. And uh, because Uganda also has forces inside of Somalia. And so they have a track record of striking out on their border countries against those that they see have come in and invaded their, uh, their land. But this doesn't mean necessarily that al-Shabaab has regrouped and represents an existential state to either Uganda or Kenya, much less the West. Uh, this could well be an act of desperation because in the counterterrorism trade, one of the lines that is often used is the more heinous the deed, the more desperate the actor. And so this may be a lashing out Maybe not as a last gasp, but certainly it has no military uh, 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 import whatsoever, and it certainly doesn't change the strategic balance between the Kenyans and the Somalis. How is this going to play out internationally? Because there, there, there are a number of foreign nationals have been killed, and curiously, that the shopping centre itself is part owned by by Israeli companies. You know, there, there's it's much wider than just Kenya, isn't it? How's what's going to happen? sort of going forward a few weeks? Well, that's going to be the interesting thing. Uh, You know, it'll be interesting to see uh, amongst the Westerners who were killed what their occupations were. Because Kenya has a a very close relationship with the security services, both military and non-military, of a number of Western countries and Israel. And uh, there are uh, special forces operators of various nationalities operating uh, from Kenya, from bases in Kenya, in the war on terror in sub-Saharan Africa, and particularly in the Horn of Africa. And so it could well be that we will find out the extent to which Kenya and Western countries have military personnel deployed in cooperative ventures to fight the Islamist threat in the Horn of Africa. And I think it in some, some measure, we may be surprised by what we find out, if in fact we find out a- anything from uh, the identities of those killed. In terms of Kenya, it's seen very much as a friend of the West. It's, it's one of the more stable sub-Saharan African countries. Is that going to change? Not necessarily. I mean, I think the, when we, we talk about stability in sub-Saharan Ar- African countries, we have to think of that as a continuum Uh, It's not the stability that we enjoy here in New Zealand. Uh, So yes, it is more stable than many of its neighbors. It's definitely pro-Western. But again, it has a failed state on its northern border. It has states 
on its western and on its southern borders that have irredentist movements of their own. I mean, we think of Boko Haram in Nigeria is yet another one of these groups that says to be associated with al-Qaeda, but is actually quite indigenous. And so what we're more than likely going to see is a beefing up of the security legislation and the security forces in Kenya, and probably an infusion of, of Western advisors, Western money, uh, in order to counter this threat out of proportion to what it really represents. Again, I have to get to the, back to the point that al-Shabaab does not represent an existential threat to Kenya, but it will serve as a, as a justification for the Kenyans to uh, bolster their defenses uh, against enemies real and imagined. You mentioned that, that you could see a scenario where this would set the, the one-third minority Muslim minority against the two-thirds Christian majority. I mean, this week we've seen that the churches burned and Christians killed in, in Pakistan. Is, is, this, is this going to be something that we'll see more of, that the setting of, of, of Muslim communities against Christian communities? Well, certainly if I was uh, one of the ideologues in any Islamist group, uh, that's the way I would play the game. And the reason for that, it creates a situation known as the sucker ploy. If you start attacking Christian, you know, Christian churches, I mean, think of Egypt, for example, and you pit Christian on Muslim, particularly in countries that are Christian dominant, then you can say to the Muslim diaspora that they're being targeted and scapegoated because of their religion. And you may gain adherence as a result of that. And so the important thing for uh, non-Muslim governments and Muslim governments alike is to play down the religious divisions and point that this is just a tactical ploy to exacerbate latent divisions and make them active. And so I, I would hope that the Kenyan government in particular would reassure both its Muslim population as well as the dominant Christian population that at least in Kenya, the divide is not so much religious as it might be socioeconomic or, or even tribal. As an FBI analyst on CBS this morning was saying that he thought this could be the start of, of a campaign waged against the West as a jihad by al-Shabaab rather than al-Qaeda. Would you agree with that? Uh, I'd have to disagree. They don't have a navy. They don't have an air force. Uh, they've shown no propensity to project force uh, beyond Kenya and uh, beyond Uganda, uh, outside of Somalia. So I think that uh, they may have pretensions and delusions of grandeur when it comes to attacking Western targets in the West. But everything indicates that, at least in terms of their capabilities, they are limited uh, to events such as this. And this could well be the height of what they can do. And admittedly, it's, it's, it's an atrocity on a, a very large scale. But I doubt very much that we're going to see them be able to take jihad uh, to the West, with the possible exception that some of their adherents may go to Europe and commit an act in Europe of a low-scale, lone wolf, small cell nature. But as a fighting force and as an ideological threat, uh, I don't think the West has much to worry about. Paul, it's always fascinating to get your insight. Thank you very much indeed. My pleasure. That's all we've got time for this week. Of course, our thoughts and prayers are with those who've been affected by the attack and their families. That's also the end of the current run of Enzo Now. Next week, we'll be taking a look back at some of the highlights of the series. So until then, from all of us on the team, bye for now. Ka kite anō.